Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Brooks, and you are with us today for a session on driving predictive uh, analytics for B2B sales success. Happy to uh, spend a little time with you in diving through this topic. It's uh, something that I find quite interesting. Hope you do too. And uh, glad to share some, some thoughts and some observations and information with you. Hope it's helpful. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today, kind of divided into five acts, if you will. Um, we're going to start talking about what I call the rise of the machines, uh, really what sales and marketing automation has done to the uh, sales pipeline and B2B organizations today. We're going to take a little bit look at what that's meaning for the sales organization, um, how that affects sales performance. And when predictive comes in to address this, uh, not all predictive approaches are the same taking a look a little bit at that, uh, that topic and see how predictive falls into some different categories. Uh, we'll look at three different scenarios where predictive is used, how it's being applied, and what kind of results it's getting for organizations, and then just have a little fun talk about what might happen next, where, where things are tending to go. Uh, like I said, my name is Kevin Brooks. Uh, I run marketing over at DX Continuum. We are a software vendor providing a solution, but you know, really my background has, has been around the enterprise software space for a number of years in supply chain and procurement, working with analytics uh, at all of these companies in different ways. And uh, really happy to be talking with you today and sharing some of what I've seen and what, uh, what's been going on really in this, in this industry. There's a lot of things moving quickly, and uh, it seems like every day there's a brand new development uh, and new, uh, <laughs> new, new vendor, new player coming into the space. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, by the way, we're going to be doing, I guess, a question section at the end. So if you've got questions and you need to, uh, you know, get something to me, we're going to have a little bit of time toward the end of the presentation to uh, to get into that. So use that little panel uh, on your screen to to ask a question or get get feedback to me as we go. So let's go ahead and keep moving here. Like I said, I'm with DX Continuum. DX Continuum is a fairly new vendor. We've, we've been around uh, for a couple of years here. We're based in Fremont in the Bay Area. Uh, we have an analytics platform focused on predictive operations for sales and marketing, and we've got a great team and some great early customers. We've done a lot of work with some of the bigger names in the Valley, and a lot of what I'm going to share with you today comes out of our, our experience and our observations working with these guys. Uh, it's a good uh, it's a good data set for us as we as we kind of build out our solution and look at the ways that predictive analytics is affecting uh, companies in this sector. So let's talk about the rise of the machines. I kind of uh, call it that because really in the last few years, it's an incredible amount of investment and energy has been put into marketing, sales automation, the category itself has grown really exponentially, and there's a lot of implications this has for the way that people think about their, their sales and marketing teams and the way they're going to operate. Uh, many of you on this call probably are already experimenting using a lot of different, uh, you know, obviously CRM tools, but also uh, marketing automation, perhaps some lead gen support. There's a lot more activity happening around uh, account-based marketing. Uh, there has been all manner of, of forecast analytics and, and various tools uh, that have been floating around for a while. They're really starting to converge. And in fact, when you, when you look, though, at the reason for a lot of this, uh, it's around growth. You know, it's, it's a very simple, uh, a simple reason for this, this kind of interest in the sales and marketing technology. And that's growth has always been the top priority for CEOs and the boards and the full organization. Uh, and, you know, just speaking as a, as a guy who's been in marketing for a while, you know, the, the desire to drive growth and to, and to project a pathway where you, sh you show not only growth in your customer base and in your revenues, but also really growth in, in your category or perhaps in your, in your segment is, is paramount. And it's easy to forget when you get down in the weeds of, of the day-to-day -day or when you get into a quarter-by-quarter, -quarter, you know, view of of uh, quotas or pipeline or campaigns, that that this top line growth is is really a key strategy that everybody is focused on, and it's one of the reasons you know one of the levers that you have really the only lever you have to drive that is your sales and marketing organization. You can't save your way to growth as uh, as, as some people have said, but the 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 overall goal here when looking at some of the data, this is KPMG uh, data and also some Salesforce data, 
is that, that this is sort of behind the scenes driving a lot of what, what gets invested in. So what does get invested? Um, well, there's been a tremendous amount of growth in this category. What you're seeing here are uh, some great, great slides from the, the guys over at uh, chiefmartech.com. They, uh, they put together this, this nice overview of, this, of the, what's generally called the MarTech space, you know, marketing technology. And, and really going back just a few years, there was, they were tracking about 150 or so companies, and now we're getting more than 3,500, almost 4,000 uh, different companies providing different segments. Yeah, I know it's hard to see perhaps on that screen, but you can go to the site and check it out yourself. There are so many segments and so many vendors in this space that it's really very difficult to get your arms around it. And a lot of the mainstream vendors are really just, or sorry, mainstream analysts are also still getting their hands around it. So you're not going to find a huge amount of market guides quite yet. You'll find investor guides. Uh, a lot of these guys are consolidating. A lot of them are, are you know, uh, tying into various, uh, uh, you know, public market strategies or, or roll-up strategies. And with account-based marketing coming into the mix, you've got even more confusing confusion there. But the point here is that. A lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, cycles are being put into technology that drives primarily marketing, primarily lead generation, primarily the top of funnel types of activities that are going to build demand and convert demand into opportunities for business. That's all very, very good. So let's, uh, let's move here along. And what you have when you're looking at a funnel is, uh, you know, we look at it at my company and many companies, there's more of a traditional marketing focus at the top, at the top funnel. And the top of the funnel really looks at who can we sell to, where are our prospects going to come from, and let's get these into the chute so that sales can take them across the line. This is your very standard sales process. And where sales tends to focus, obviously, is uh, taking those opportunities and those and those um, uh, sales qualified leads, if you will, and taking them through into the customer base and closing the deals. It's a very, you know, obviously oversimplified view of the things, but this is how most most organizations work. And you have a division of labor between where marketing is focused and where sales is focused. And like I said, a lot of these solutions that have been in the market have been focused on the area up front, have been focused on that prospecting, lead scoring side of, side of the equation. So let's keep moving forward. And when we look at, whoops, when we look at the, uh, the, the, the challenge that puts into the sales organization is that your volume's suddenly gone up. That, that tremendous amount of investment and activity that's gone into creating more efficient lead processes, better ways to send emails, better ways to cultivate social media, to, uh, to scrape leads and, and high value prospects, sales is getting hit with this. And in many cases, the sales organization is not equipped to handle that volume of leads coming at them. And so into this environment is where you're seeing the, uh, the, the, the frustration. So you're seeing sales teams, and we see it at my company, I'm sure many of you see it at yours as well, that sales does not have the ability to handle the volume that's coming at them, and they're also looking for higher quality of, of, uh, of leads. So there's a lot of ways this has come at, come at them, and uh, it's come through marketing automation to make them more productive, being able to convert these, these uh, opportunities. There's a lot of services investment happening, there are uh, a lot of different process changes happening. In technology, there's really the rise of the uh, sales, uh, the SDRs, sort of that pre-sales role that's always been there. It's getting a bit more formalized in today's world with, uh, with new approaches to, for example, account-based selling. So you're restructuring teams and you're also changing the way products get bought. You know, the, the subscription model, the rise of SaaS software, but in many different ways, packaging is also changing to enable uh, a more productive and effective uh, sales and marketing operation. The problem is, if you look at there on the right, this is uh, the C CSO Insights um, data, which is used quite often throughout the industry. Reps aren't achieving quota. Um, they're flat to declining in most cases. And there are many reasons for that. You could talk about perhaps it's misset expectations, perhaps it's 
you know, they're, they're not uh, staffed or, or skill sets are appropriate. The bottom line is with all of this investment, you're not seeing a corresponding rise in sales' ability to convert, uh, convert demand, convert all this traction into new business. So something's going on here that is stopping the, the, the benefit and the lift from getting all the way through the, through the pipeline. And into this area is really where you're finding the, the uh, attraction to predictive analytics. And we'll get into what and why that might be, because when people look at predictive analytics, what they hear is something that can tell them, oh, great, it can solve all my, it's going to tell me exactly what to do, it's going to give me my, my perfect sort of outcome, I just need to layer in predictive analytics. Well, you know, uh, let's, let's investigate that a little bit, because not all predictive solutions and not all predictive approaches are really the same. They may look the same. They may have a lot of attractive qualities, but there, there's some differences that are worth thinking about and that uh, I wanted to share with all of you. So, so as we look at predictive, let's start with a definition. So definitions are always good. Uh, and uh, I think everybody is familiar with, um, you know, this idea that predictive is some sort of voodoo-y Zoltar, you know, looking at your future through some sort of a, a crazy looking glass and, and magically predicting what's going to happen. But then there's the other side of it that is like, ah, oh, it's a very intense data driven. There's just lots of crunching of numbers and got to get massive amounts of data. It's really just a data thing. Um, a nice definition, I think, just brings these ideas together, which is that you're looking at the future. Yes, without a doubt. You are making predictions about the future, so it's probabilistic at its core. Uh, but you're also looking at data, and you're taking advantage of some of the newer abilities to crunch data, to apply machine learning and data modeling in such a way that can get you a higher degree of accuracy than ever before has been available to, uh, uh, to look at various business problems. And so predictive has the ability to potentially solve this problem where you've got a lot of volume coming in and you've got productivity that is, that is stuck in, in neutral. Let's dig into that definition a little bit deeper because when you think about predictive, um, one way to think about it and one of the way one of my colleagues likes to talk about it is uh, laboratory predictive versus operational predictive. And so when you think about laboratory predictive, this is what in many cases is sort of the old fashioned way to think about predictive analytics. You've got a great group of data scientists, you have very powerful tools, software tools, data aggregation tools, uh, and you're modeling, you're building a model, you're developing a hypothesis, you're driving against a, a, a known challenge, and it's a, typically a very big one. Um, and retail, in the retail sector, they've been doing this for years. This is a this is sort of the, the traditional way that, that predictive analytics is done. And you're, you're trying to drive toward a um, uh, towards something that is going to make a big impact in the organization, kind of a one-shot, moonshot type of deal. Takes a long time, but it has a lot of value. On, on the flip side, and the piece that's coming into play a little bit more now is what, what we call operational predictive analytics. And this is a little bit more lightweight. This is something that sits more with the frontline users. It moves faster. And it's something that is a little bit more uh, flexible because of the conditions and just the practical realities of how you need to use analytics uh, in the day-to-day -day type of business. This is a very different type of a thing, even though they're both looking at predictive uh, futures, one approach is more tied to usability and flexibility and adaptability. The other is tied to really diving deep, deep, deep and getting into, and getting into some really thorny problems with perhaps some specialized approaches. The other way to think about uh, the, the kind of division between um, uh, uh, you know, the different approaches to, to predictive is that, oops, let me get there. Well, going forward here, is that you have sort of a, a demand-based approach versus a sales operations-based approach. And this is something that, that uh, people don't tend to think about as much, but it's very, it's very relevant to, to our conversation today. Whoops, let me get back here. And that's, that's because when you think of predictive and all the solutions out there, many of them are focused on the idea of who do we sell to. 
looking at the wider universe of potential prospects, and this is great, it's very important information. Most of the vendors on the market today are looking at this idea of, you know, who can we sell to? That's marketing's core challenge, bring demand into the pipe. The problem is, is on the sales side, you've also got a, a focus on how do I orient my time? What can I do to make my numbers? That's great that we have all these opportunities. It's great that we have all this potential business. But i got to focus and prioritize my time to make my numbers and for the company to meet forecast demands. These are different challenges. These are different applications of predictive uh, into to the business. They're both important. Most of the emphasis has been on the left side of that equation. Less of the emphasis has been on the right side, although that is starting to change a bit more. Advance here. And again, I will remind everybody, if you've got questions, if there's something that uh, uh, you, you want me to kind of get to here at the end, just go ahead and drop it into the, into the question panel as we're going along. And we'll get this advancing. So, so as we're as we're working along in terms of thinking about the the kinds of predictive that, that are out there, something else to keep in mind is that when predictive, mo the, the way predictive work is, you build a model and you execute against that model, and you you see what the model runs in terms of what the data it gives you. Well, you've got data scientists and skill sets on one side of the equation that tend to be building models, and this is the traditional laboratory way. And you've got engineers who are coding things or bringing things into the uh, into the front end of the equation. Maybe they're putting it into software, putting it into decision cycles, putting it into some kind of a, you know, uh, uh, an analytics uh, dashboard or something like that. These two, these two groups don't always have the same skill sets or the same uh, objectives in mind. So you've had a hard time getting these great data models that have been in the laboratory approach operationalized, partially because they're, they're coming from different worlds, partially because they're also uh, different skill sets. And when you're building a model, what you what you get is uh, it's a very straightforward process, really. It's you're extracting data, you're preparing data, you're creating the models, you're executing against those models, and you're generating output. So this this is predictive. When you talk about predictive analytics, this is what's going on. And the question is really how can this apply to the business problems that that you have, and what kind of data do you need, what sort of uh, skill set do you need to to use it, and so forth. So I thought we'd jump into a little bit of the, uh, out of that sort of definitional side and now talk a little bit about predictive in action. So when you apply all these things to real world scenarios, what do you see, what do you get? And how is it starting to maybe address that problem of, of, uh, of sales not being able to fully realize the benefits of all this investment in marketing automation that's been going on? So three scenarios I'd like to talk a little bit about. One is around the classic sort of lead to opportunity to conversion. Um, people have different names for this, but it's essentially the idea that when you've got a potential opportunity, marketing is delivering it, handing it over to sales organization, and sales is grabbing it and committing to, to driving that business forward. So that's what I mean by the conversion there. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the other example that there's a lot of interest in right now, and that there's there's been consistent interest in this around predictive, is cross-selling and upselling. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And in some ways, that's one of the most common applications of, of predictive analytics, and it's now making its way more into the B2B space. And then finally, marketing attribution. This is this is something that's very interesting to a lot of segments. It's extraordinarily difficult to do because it. And what I mean by marketing attribution is when you've got assets or campaigns or programs that you're running in marketing, what is the configuration of that that aligns most uh, positively with closed deals, with business that you can, you can count, on, count on happening, and with opportunities that are the highest likelihood to, to convert into closed business? That's hard to do for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk about that here, but um, people are making some good strides on that. On that. So let's talk a little bit about lead to opportunity conversion uh, once we get the slides advancing. So lead to opportunity conversion, like I said, with this, with this advent of marketing automation solutions, a lot of marketing-oriented data, a lot of marketing-oriented uh, automation, what you have is a lot of marketing-qualified 
leads coming into the pipe. And I'm, you know, I'm using Salesforce terminology, but you could use any terminology of whatever system you've got. You've, you've got a marketing um, opportunity for business. And these opportunities have gone through some level of marketing uh, grading, if you will. I don't want to call it, quite call it scoring, although you may, you may want to call it scoring. But marketing has gotten to the point where something has done enough for sales to take a look at it. The problem is that that crux point, there, there's a lot of data coming over, there's a lot of leads coming over to sales that are not worth their time. And marketing may not be aware of that. Uh, perhaps your scoring algorithm says or your approach says, hey, if they've downloaded the data sheet from our website and if they've gone to see a demo, they're great. They're, they're good. Sales should talk to them. That may or may not be true. And, and at this pivot point between marketing and sales, this is really where in predictive can drive a high impact. And you're starting to see analysts taking a look at this. I think Forrester is seeing around a 6x lift when you can focus your uh, when you can focus your predictive attention in this space, and when you really start answering the questions that sales has about these leads and these opportunities coming at them, you know, is this worth investing my time? When will it close? What's the price point of this? Do it, if I've got two opportunities coming at me, how do I know which one's really going to be a better, better fit with what I need to focus on for, for this quarter or maybe next quarter or, or the year? Uh, now, at the same time, like I said before, sharing a little bit more CSO data, the, the execution challenges coming from sales are, it's a little hard to read, I understand, but is the idea for generating enough qualified leads is the biggest complaint. So you've got all these leads coming at sales, but sales is still complaining that there's not enough high quality leads coming at them. Marketing solution to this typically is, well, just throw more leads in the pipe. Because if you throw more leads in proportionally, of course, you're going to have a greater number of high-value leads if you just fill the pipe with more stuff. And like we've talked about probably, you know, I've made my point on this, that volume is not necessarily solved here. Although on paper it's solved in practical terms, the, the sales organization cannot catch that many leads coming at them and cannot discern the, the good ones the high value ones from the ones that are just going to waste their time. And so being able to focus predictive in this space is really where you start to see value. And in fact, uh, an example of where, where this has happened, you know, you want to look at something like this. This is, uh, I'm going to share some screens from our software, but really it's not so much about DX continuum as it is about the idea that you're applying predictive analytics at the point where uh, lead information is converting into opportunity information. So what you see here is, is something that's showing, you know, if you can look simply across whatever your lead funnel looks like as a sales rep and understand that there are higher value leads coming at you with a greater likelihood to close. In this particular version, it's on the right side with the dark, dark bars. And if you could drill down into that and look into maybe some of the reasons for that, you could prioritize your, your approach a little bit better. You could focus on the information then that lets you on the opportunities and leads that lets you make your numbers. And this is exactly what we saw happen. This, in fact, being able to do this was one of the primary use cases at our company. Um, we saw an incredible lift in opportunity. We had a situation where we had a, a, a large technology vendor. Uh, their marketing team was driving something to the order of 70,000 leads at the sales organization every month. And the problem was that the sales organization themselves could not handle more than about five to seven thousand. Could not just couldn't touch enough of those leads. And so internal processes, some internal scoring, some you know just uh, basic heuristic approaches could get that seventy thousand number maybe down to around twenty thousand or so. You're still dealing with an awful lot of leads that are just never going to be touched by sales because they don't have the capacity for it. Two solutions. You could add more salespeople, of course. You could just add, you know, help them get more volume through. Uh, that adds cost, of course. Um, or you could do a better job of taking those 20,000 leads and parsing out the cream, uh, you know, the cream from, from you know, the, the skimming the cream from the top and looking at those leads that are most likely to come into uh, into a closed deal. And that's exactly what we did. And that's, that's how, by applying predictive to that 
set of leads, which ones are the best ones to pursue? It had a tremendous impact. I mean, you're looking at something like a 30 times ROI on, on the invested effort, no additional headcount coming in, doubled the number of conversions coming across from marketing. So marketing is often evaluated based on the number of leads coming over that sales accepts. And half the number of leads came over, but twice the number of conversions. So you, you've got a much more efficient pipe and you didn't have to add any headcount coming in. And this is because you're able to apply at that pivot point between sales and marketing, uh, a more intelligent way to look at which leads are likely to convert into opportunities. Now the science underneath this, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not gonna pretend to give you all of the models and the algorithms and so forth. But I will tell you that, you know, having uh, something that can adapt to changing conditions and something that is built into a process so it's continuously getting better uh, is really what you want to have. You, you don't really want to just throw this over to a data science team to say, hey, figure out a model to, to uh, align our sales data better or say our, our marketing leads a little bit better with our sales organization. You can do that. You can, you can apply some really high-end brains to this problem and solve it once, but then as conditions change, you're back to a laboratory approach having to rebuild models, rethink things. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. And, and so you need something a little bit more lightweight. And the solutions that are on the market today are starting to look at this problem. Let me go to the, another example here for you. I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, with Amazon. Uh, you know, my son plays baseball. He's a little guy. He loves, loves all his baseball things. And, uh, you know, if I'm going on Amazon, I may be looking at a net or something to throw throw uh, for him to practice his, his throwing around with, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look on Amazon, I'm going to see uh, a product, and then what I will also see is a whole bunch of recommendations. I'll say, look, this is something that was bought together with this. Here's a bunch of things that other people that bought this product, they also bought this. What you're seeing here is retail predictive analytics. There is a lot of data that Amazon has, everybody knows that. And they're using it and applying it in a smart way to suggest, hey, you know what, you might want to get this with it. It tends to, tends to go together. This is really what we're talking about. This idea is beginning to come over into the B2B space. And this is enabled 100% by what predictive can bring into an organization. So when we look at this, how this plays out in a, in a practical sense, if you've got a couple customers and customer A has product A and B, customer one is product A and B, and customer two is product A and C, the natural question is like, well, hey, well, maybe if these guys are similar enough, perhaps product C is a good fit to add into product to customer one, and perhaps product B is great for customer two. They get more of our product, they are happier, they get more value, and it's like that Amazon thing, you know, customers that bought this also bought this. The challenge is, is how do you know that product C is the right product for customer one? There may be a reason why customer one doesn't have it. There may be some fundamental thing that's different about customer one and customer two that just isn't apparent on the surface. And what if you have more than A, B, and C products? What if, for example, one of our customers, what if you've got a thousand products? And what if you've got combinations of various products that go together and various products that don't go together? And you, what if then you add into that complexity service offerings on top of that, warranty plans, maintenance agreements? What if you've got related partner uh, uh, commits? You have a very, very complex situation pretty quickly. And being able to just look at that data and know, hey, you know, these guys don't have this product, maybe we should throw it into the mix. That, that is not something that's, that's feasible or practical. And so if you're a large sales organization and you have a big product catalog, being able to do this is something that's not really possible without, without some level of automation and some level of, of analytics to help you out. Now what predictive can do in this particular scenario is, is enable you to bundle packages based upon what is likely to be bought together. But more than that, if you could know also the likelihood of that bundle to be purchased, so you're not wasting time putting a bundle together for somebody who's really unlikely to buy it. 
This is where you start really seeing the productivity gains in the sales organization because the cross-selling and upselling is not just a number. You don't just pitch to everybody this product and see what, see what, who will buy it. You may end up pissing off some of your customers or you may end up inadvertently pitching something that doesn't go together uh, and creating more problems and then you're wasting cycles fixing that versus going after other kinds of revenue that you could get. So this is, was exactly the situation with, again, another customer of ours. And when you look at how the solution came to be, what you get is, I'm sharing a simple screen here, but a combination of products that were very, very complex. And I don't know if you can see very well, but what you see is a pop-up in the middle. When you pick an opportunity, when you're picking a solution and you drill into that, just like that Amazon customers that bought this also bought this, you're seeing customers that had this product, this many customers also had this other product. But beyond that, I don't know if you can see the, the minus signs and the plus signs in that middle column. To know what does this net bundle do to the predictive uh, likelihood of the deal closing, that's where the power starts to come from. And uh, if you can see there, one of these combinations you add that product in, it actually increases the likelihood of a deal closing. So this is very powerful stuff. And, and this adds millions, this added millions of dollars to the immediate quarter revenue of a particular customer that we worked with. Uh, we were able to add at least one product recommendation per customer. And this, these are products that are also involving um, partners. Right, so you've got partners that may or may not be aware of the full suite of a customer, but they can take a look at a, a binary. Hey, this product goes with this, let's pitch it. Uh, and what we saw was at least a 20% acceptance rate on all the net new conditions. You don't get 100, but a 20% acceptance on all proposed offerings, that brought significant benefits to the organization. And when you net that out across, like I said, the complexity of a, of a, of a B2B sales organization, that starts to become powerful data and that affects that sales productivity number that we saw that's been stuck, stuck flat for several, several quarters and several years actually now. So let me move uh, forward into the final example here. And this is something that there's a lot of interest in. Uh, and this is really around the marketing attribution. Um, if you can see the data there, what this is looking at, we, so we had an opportunity to take a look at the you know, marketing automation data coming in and, and CRM data and a lot of data coming in from a, in another large technology vendor. And we looked, at, we looked at a couple things. We looked at how many uh, contacts were being touched by a, by a, a marketing campaign. And then when those, when those uh, contacts were touched, uh, what was the likelihood of that lead or that, excuse me, that account converting into a, a sales opportunity, opportunity that sales would take? So again, that pivot point between sale, marketing and sales. So as you can see on the left graph, the more contacts there were with an account um, or the more contacts that were touched at an account, the greater the likelihood that the lead would turn into an opportunity. That's great, that's what we want. But what's interesting is you match that then with the, the, the graph on the right, and again, the blue line you're seeing there is the likelihood, the predicted likelihood of the lead turning into an opportunity. But if you touched a single contact more than once, you got to a point of diminishing returns. So. What this tells a marketing organization is go wide, not deep, right? So you're going to get a better conversion ratio if you touch more people versus touching one person many times. Now that can have implications on how you think about your targeting, your segmenting. It can have implications about where you prioritize your spend. It can have a lot of implications. And this is just one sort of thin slice where predictive data that's brought into a marketing uh, attribution view can perhaps change where you're putting your emphasis and delivering stronger results. I'll give you one more example here of the of, of where predictive plays into marketing attribution. And this really is the frontier, folks. I mean, I think when you're looking at where, uh, you know, your greatest potential impact can come, 
it's it's yes, it's sales productivity, and you get sales organizations closing more business. But if you can know with a greater level of certainty where to invest your marketing dollars to get the greatest likelihood of closed business, that's extremely powerful, and it lets you do an awful lot more with one of the greater spend uh, spend lines on a on, on a sales and marketing. You know, as a marketing guy, you know you're you're carrying a lot of budget. You're spending a lot, and and it's tricky to know sometimes that that spend is is yielding all the results you want, not just engagement, but true closed business results. So what you're looking at here is another area where there's some interest in looking at uh, marketing spend, and that's around the digital side. So let me start with the box there first. Fascinating information here, and what you're looking at is, for digital marketing, these were like the online ads. So when someone engaged in this particular case, how many engagements did they have with our digital assets? And did they engage with it, with it? And was that correlated in some way to a likelihood to become business? Well, what you see there on the left side of that box is when you're creating an opportunity. So going from lead to opportunity, when you touch a when you touch a campaign, uh, that's that yes column. The blue bar goes up. The blue line goes up. So that means it does have an impact. It's a greater likelihood that that lead is going to become a, uh, a, a an opportunity. But then on the right side, when you look at once it's become an opportunity and if it touches a digital campaign, it actually depresses the likelihood that that becomes closed business. So that's telling you that there's some marginal impact that happens when somebody's touching our digital ads prior to it becoming an opportunity and would become when they're already in the pipe engage with an opportunity. Now the implications, you know, depend on circumstances, depend on a lot of things, but knowing, for example, that you hit people early with ads versus late with ads in the sales cycle, that may change some way you think about how you do your online targeting. And it could have profound implications for campaign approaches. The other one is something everybody wants to know in, in terms of, you know, if more people hit our website, that seems like that's a good thing. Marketing teams tend to optimize toward that. So uh, this actually says the opposite. Uh, in this particular case, when someone did hit the website, it actually depressed the likelihood that something would turn into a converted opportunity. And that, you know, intuitively that doesn't make sense, but when you go back and think that there's a lot of junk in that uh, MQL uh, funnel going into sales, and there's a lot of things that just don't convert, this is reflecting that volume. The volume coming in off the website in this particular case was perhaps not as high quality as the stuff that came in directly that never touched the website or never engaged with a web asset. So again, some counterintuitive thinking here can start to come through and, and it's all probabilistic, right? So you can interrogate and look at it in different ways, but this is the kind of information that predictive can bring into sales and marketing that is really not easily accessed today or accessed up, up till up till the tank today. So take a breath. Quick recap here. So a lot of sales and marketing is occurring. It's on the rise. Uh, productivity in the sales side of, of the funnel has really remained flat, even while marketing is delivering more and more and more into the pipe. There's a lot that can be done with predictive analytics, but there's different kinds of predictive. And we didn't talk as much about the pure demand generation predictive on this on this particular webinar, that's perhaps a topic for another time. But there, it's worth noting that predictive is not the same thing everywhere. Uh, and then I wanted to share a couple of examples there with uh, lead conversion, cross sell, upsell, and marketing attribution um, as we as we move toward the toward the close here. So, what happens next? What's the what's the view here about what happens? Well, my view, uh, for what it's worth, and and like I said, you know, we're, we're all trying to predict the future in different ways in different contexts. But, you know, I really see that there's a there's an increased use of predictive technology across sales and marketing teams. So this is not going to fade away. This isn't a fad. This is going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, the question is really, how do you apply it? And there's a shift in this emphasis from these laboratory approaches that have been around for years and years and years that have very specialized groups. And those groups are going to stay and remain specialized. They're not going away. It's just that there's a new class of, of predictive analytics that are coming in that, that is more operational in its focus. 
And then finally, we didn't talk about that too much on this call, but something I'm seeing and that many of you perhaps are seeing too is that as you have all these various points where predictive comes into play, you know, the idea of something that's like a platform or something that's working across several use cases underneath your or all your data is, is something that uh, seems to make sense that that might be coming uh, in a bit bit later in the in our evolution of the um, of the of the space but that's that's kind of what what I'm seeing happening next I think you're going to see that sales productivity number and that sales productivity metrics start to go on the rise in the next few years as sales teams figure this out and they start to gain the benefits of what um, marketing's been getting the benefits of this for a while sales is starting to catch up a little bit more now with that so I hope that quick flyby of a lot of things was helpful for all of you guys. I'd like to uh, definitely invite any questions that anybody has at this moment. And, uh, you know, if, if you're listening to this on replay, if you have, have questions, go ahead and email me. I'll share the email here at the end. Um, but, you know, it's a topic I, that I think is very interesting. Just personally and professionally, I've been in marketing for a long time, and I've also been able to see the evolution of a lot of trends and a lot of categories. Uh, this one has, has legs. There's a lot of interesting things happening here, and uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing it in our customers, but I'm also seeing it in just my, my peers and colleagues in marketing across uh, much larger companies than, than what we are at DX Continuum are, are starting to uh, really get excited about this stuff. So uh, let, me, let me step back and see if there's any questions coming in and, and uh, if anybody has, has anything they'd like to, to ask me as we're going forward here. I see there is a question about whether you, whether you'll receive the deck. I believe that the deck is visible on the Bright Talk network for for some time, and if you're uh, um, able to get that, um, great. If not, or if you have some problem with that, just go ahead and drop me an email. I'm happy to share. Okay. Well, if there's not a lot of uh, big questions coming coming at you, I appreciate you spending some time with me today. And uh, I, I look forward to, to your comments and feedback. Please feel free to, uh, to drop me a line and uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to share some of, our, uh, some of our thoughts here with you today. So thank you very much. And I think with that, we've reached the end of the session. I will, uh, I will sign off. Thank you all very much. <laughs>